This evening, I intend to discuss with you the toughness and the tenderness of Jesus. Now, I will look at the tough side of the Lord's nature before considering the tender side. And I would urge that you remain until I have finished. I believe that a mind, like a parachute, functions only when open. As a beginning place, I want to read a statement from a recent Bachelor Barry Baxter sermon delivered on Herald of Truth Radio. Most radios have a device by which the low frequencies and the high frequencies can be screened out, leaving only those sounds which are appealing to the human ear. The human mind is also like that. We have a device by which we can tune out those things that we do not particularly want to believe or hear. The human mind screens out that which it doesn't particularly want to believe or hear. The human mind screens that which it doesn't particularly like to believe and accepts that which is most appealing and most pleasant. This happens when we look at Jesus. The human mind often sees in Jesus those qualities that it wants to see. A great many people have the idea that the predominant overall characteristic of our Lord is one of gentleness, kindness, and amicability. Well, there is a great deal of truth in this, but when we think of Jesus only as being long-suffering and gentle and kind, we have missed something that a Puritan writer three centuries ago described as the stormy north side of Jesus Christ. I'm reading now from Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elijah, and some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Nineteen hundred years ago, when our Lord was among men, he asked his disciples what others were saying about him. Not that he needed the information, because I'm sure he knew, but he intended to lead his disciples into a truth they would not soon forget. They said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah, some say that you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now, when people said those things about the Lord, they were mistaken. Nevertheless, they had good reason for saying that he was John the Baptist. They had good reason for saying that he was Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets, because Christ was like all three of those men, and he was like the prophets. And I am convinced that if you and I can comprehend something of the nature of those three men, then we will better understand the identity of our Lord. First, there were those who said that he was John the Baptist. Now, why would they say it? After all, John was dead. According to Matthew 14, two chapters earlier, Herod Antipas gave a birthday party, and he invited all of his important people to attend. And in the midst of the festivities, Salome, the daughter of Herodias, danced. And it must have been a voluptuous dance indeed, because apparently with bated breath, Herod said to her, Girl, anything you want up to half my kingdom, just ask for it and I'll give it to you. She went to her mother and sought advice. Her mother was angry with John the Baptist because he had denounced her marriage to Herod Antipas. And therefore she asked that John might be killed. She's not the first nor the last to seek for the head of the preacher. However, unlike so many others, she was successful in her request. Herod didn't want to kill John, but after all, he had made a rash vow in the presence of so many dignitaries, and hence he sent the word, and John was slain. Herod must have been a bit like a man in Jackson County, just north of us. He lived many years ago and killed another person. And he said every night he rode after the slaying, the dead man was in the saddle with him. And I can imagine that after Herod Antipas killed John the Baptist, he went to his bedroom at night and he saw the ghost of John. According to Luke chapter 9, when people began to say that Jesus was John raised from the dead, at first Herod was perplexed by that. However, when you put Luke 9 and Matthew 14 together, you see that he soon overcame his perplexity And he concluded that the rumor was right. He added an impetus to it. And the thing spread like wildfire. Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead. But again, why would anyone say that Jesus was John? Well, they were kinsmen. After all, they may have looked alike. Perhaps they were about the same height, had the same weight, same color of eyes, same color of hair. I don't know. This I do know, they preached alike. In Matthew 3, 1 and 2, And in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Repentance, uh, simply interpreted, means to yield one's will to the will of God. And John the Baptist was saying, if you're going to be prepared to enter the Messianic kingdom, then you need to repent. The kingdom is imminent. It's nigh. It's nearby. It's just around the corner. And if you need to get ready for it by experiencing repentance. Well, a little later, John the Baptist was placed in prison. And according to Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Both of these men then bore down on the importance of repentance. And both of them taught the eminence of the kingdom of God. But both of them had something to say about baptism. According to Luke 3, 3, John preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John placed such emphasis on baptism, and he spent so much time baptizing, he was known as the Baptist. Now, the word Baptist describes his work. We refer to Luke as the beloved physician because he engaged in the healing arts. And we refer to Simon as the tanner because he tanned the hides or the skins of animals. And John was a Baptist in that he baptized other people. If you'll read Mark 1, verse 4 in the RSV, he will be referred to as John the Baptizer. I am a Baptist. I am a Baptist because I baptize other people. If the word Baptist had been translated instead of having been transliterated, we would read of John the Immerser, or John the Submerger, or as unusual as it may sound, even John the Dipper, or John the Plunger, because that's precisely what the word means. He was called the Baptist because he immersed people, he submerged people, he dipped people, or he plunged people. But Jesus had some things to say about baptism as well. According to John 3.26, one of the disciples of the Baptist went to him and said, The one to whom you bore witness is now baptizing, and everyone is going to him. And then at John 4.1 and 2, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, uh, yet Jesus did not do it himself, but by means of his disciples. Uh, he actually uh, baptized more people than John the Baptist. He didn't do it with his own hands. He never personally immersed anyone, but he did it through the instrumentality of his disciples. So both of these men uh, taught repentance. They both taught the nearness of the kingdom. They both taught baptism. And both of these men preached against hypocrisy. If you'll read Luke chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 3, put the two together, you'll see that in the audience that John addressed, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said, Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath which is to come? Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Now, he recognized that these people were impenitent. Now, he saw that they were insincere. He said, Bring forth the fruit that's meet or worthy of repentance. And I think, frankly, he refused to baptize them. And if you and I had proof positive today that someone was insincere in his profession, I think we would do right in not immersing that particular person. John hated hypocrisy with a purple passion, and he tore into it with all of his power. But our Lord was like that. A more scathing denunciation ever fell from the lips of any man than the one recorded in Matthew chapter 23. He said, Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why, he said, You compass land and sea to make a proselyte, and when you've made one, you make him twofold more a son of hell than you are yourselves. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you devour widows' houses, and then for pretense you make long prayers. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, on the outside you're like a platter or a cup that's washed and is clean, but on the inside you're filled with extortion and excess. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, on the outside you're like whited sepulchres, but on the inside you're filled with dead men's bones. And he asked, How can you escape the damnation of hell? Each of these men hit hypocrisy hard. But both men had some things to say about hell. According to Matthew chapter 3, John said, The axe is laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bring forth fruit will be hewn down and cast into the fire. To what is that an allusion? He continued, He that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into his garner and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And according to Mark 9, the unquenchable fire is the fire of hell itself. John then talked about hell fire. And I beg you to hear this. 
The word Gehenna, properly translated as hellfire, does not appear but twelve times in the Greek New Testament. And eleven of those twelve times, that word is to be found upon the lips of the precious Son of God. And the only other time it appears is in the third chapter of James, written by the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote more like Christ spoke than any other inspired person. Eleven of the twelve times that hell is mentioned in the Bible, Jesus said it. Why? Because he was mad? Because he didn't love people? Today, if you have much to say about hell, many think it's because you're unloving or because you're angry with others. I have warned my three children about busy streets, deep water, tornadoes, mad dogs, strangers. Why in the world did I warn my children about these dangers? Because I was mad at them? Because I didn't love them? To the contrary, because I was concerned about them and because I did love them. And if we go through life never warning people to flee from the wrath to come, never telling them that there is a hell to escape, it's not a sign of love on our part. Jesus, the loving Son of God, warned people. And He talked about hell. I don't believe we ought to major in it, but I think we're a coward if we refuse to discuss it. The Lord Jesus Christ did, John did, and I think this is one of the reasons that the identity of the two was confused. But these men were also alike in that each was an individual of self-denial. John the Baptist wore camel's hair and leather. I doubt that he would have been listed among the ten best-dressed men in Palestine of the first century. Uh, that was the clothing of the poor. He dressed as did Elijah. And uh, for a diet, he had locusts and wild honey. I used to imagine John the Baptist reaching out and grabbing a grasshopper and just <coughs> pitching it in, and down it went. I thought, well, I haven't ever did just reach into the water, grab a fish, and pitch it into my mouth and swallow it. Now, I've caught a few fish with my hands or with a dip net, but uh, always clean them and cook them. So I decided to little, do a little studying on this locust bit, and I found out they cleaned the grasshoppers, and they had a way of cooking them, and, and so he didn't just grab one and pitch it in, and down it would go. But in 1964, two friends and I were eating at Tiberius on the western shore of the Galilean Sea, and, and I happened to look up. I said, hey, fellas, look up there. I said, you know what kind of tree this is? He said, no. I said, it's a locust tree. Now, in Arkansas, a locust tree is a thorn tree. But in Palestine, a locust tree is one that has these long pods filled with beans hanging on it. And when the Bible says John the Baptist ate locusts, it may mean that he ate beans. It may not be talking about grasshoppers. But either way you look at it, locusts and wild honey, not much of a diet. And because of his mission, the Lord intended that he set an austere example of self-denial. Camel's hair and leather, locusts and wild honey. But what about Jesus? His parents took him to the temple to make an offering according to the law. That was when Jesus was a baby. And the law said you're to offer a lamb and a turtle dove or a pigeon. But the mother and the legal father of Jesus offered two birds. You see, the law made an exception. It said if people were so poor they couldn't offer a lamb and a pigeon, then they could offer two birds. And the Lord's parents offered the two birds, which indicates they were among the peasantry. They were among the poor. They could have never made the trip down into Egypt had it not been for the wise men who came from the east and gave them gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Jesus and Peter were going into Capernaum. They were asked to pay the tax. The Lord didn't reach into his pocket, pull out the money, and give it to the tax gatherer. Rather, he told Peter to go to the Galilean Sea, cast in a hook. First fish he caught, he said, open his mouth, you'll find the money there. Peter found the shekel, brought it back, half shekel for Jesus, half shekel for himself. Why didn't Jesus pay the man? Apparently because he didn't have the money. Apparently that's the reason for it. A disciple came to him and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, well, the birds have the nest, the foxes have their hold. The Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. 
I've been a Christian, I think, for more than 20 years before I realized that every statement in the New Testament directed to the rich has application to me. You want to know how Jesus lived? Make a trip to the Middle East. Do you know there are hundreds of thousands of people in Africa today who live on less than $100 a year? And if you think that all of the Arabs in the Middle East are driving golden Cadillacs, you couldn't be worse wrong. That oil money is tied up to a select few. Most of them are so poor we can't even begin to imagine to commence to understand their poverty. And even during the dark days of the Depression, where my family and your family and all of the people in this country had such hard times, we were in the midst of prosperity. When you compare those days with the Middle East, and you look at the peasantry in the Middle East today, and you'll know exactly the kind of life Jesus lived. Jesus and John the Baptist were both alike, and that both of them were men of self-denial. But they were both personalities of courage. Why, like John the Baptist had the audacity to rebuke a king. He said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. According to Leviticus 16, under the law, a man could not marry his brother's wife. The only exception to the rule is in Deuteronomy 25. It's called the Leveret Law. When a man died, he had no children. Then it was the responsibility of his surviving brother to marry the widow. And the first male child born to that union was to be named after the dead brother. And that was done to perpetuate his name. Otherwise, you could not marry your brother's wife. That's exactly what Herod Antipas had done. John the Baptist rebuked him, and it cost him his life. He had courage in order to do a thing like that. But Jesus had courage. There are a lot of young people in this audience, and I know you see Jesus a little differently than I do. I think of the Lord as a young man. He did His work in His early 30s. He died when He was 33. I'm 17 years on the other side of that. That young man tore into the religious establishment of his day, and he said, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And they killed him. And he didn't die under a barrage of bouquets. He died with cold steel in his hands. And in his feet, Jesus and John were courageous. It isn't any wonder then that people said, Hey, this is John the Baptist come back from the dead. Now, when you contemplate John, what do you see? Do you see a namby, pamby, wishy washy, stand for nothing, fall for everything kind of personality? Well, I tell you, I see a fire eating prophet who would fight a circle saw for what he believed was right. And people thought Jesus was John the Baptist. And then there were some who thought he was Elijah. Well, who was Elijah? He was a man who had lived in Israel about 800 years earlier. Unusual thing about Elijah, he never died. He and Elisha were together one day, and they were separated from one another by horses and a chariot of fire. And then Elijah went to heaven in a whirlwind. And the last two verses in the Old Testament, Malachi predicted that Elijah would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrived. And many of the Jewish people knew that prediction, and they understood it to mean that the same man who had lived eight centuries earlier would return. Now, that isn't what God meant, but that's what they thought it meant. According to Matthew 11 and Matthew 17, Jesus said the Elijah to come was John the Baptist. And yet, according to John chapter 1, when the people went from Jerusalem out to talk to John, he denied being Christ, he denied being Elijah, he denied being the prophet, the one predicted in Deuteronomy 18. Jesus said he was Elijah. John said he wasn't. And yet both men were right. Jesus meant he was the antitype. He was like Elijah. To use Luke 1, 17, he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. John the Baptist meant he was not that same person. A lot of people fail to see that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of the Elijah prediction, and they thought Jesus was the fulfillment of that prediction. Elijah lived at a time when almost all of Israel had gone into digression, apostasy, and idolatry. As a matter of fact, he and 7,000 others were loyal to the Lord, and that was it. And the people were trying to worship Baal, the male god of fertility, and, and the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth. They had spiritual schizophrenia, trying to hold hands with both. So Elijah came before them. He said, if Baal is God, follow him. But if the Lord is God, follow him. And he said, I have a proposition. Elijah has 400, uh, Baal has 450 false prophets, and I own him a prophet for the Lord. Let them offer sacrifice to their God, and I'll offer sacrifice to my God. 
And the one who answers the fire, let him be God. Well, that pleased the people. So they went to Mount Carmel. And those false prophets built their altar. They cut up the wood and laid it in order. And they cut up the sacrifice and put it on top of the wood. And then they began to cry, Oh, Baal, send down the fire. Sincere? Oh, yes. A God of their imagination now. They're calling upon Him, sincerely thinking that He'll answer. Send down the fire. Well, they yelled until about noontime. Then Elijah mocked them. He said, Hey, fellas, what's happened to your God? Is He going on a journey? Is He musing? Maybe he's going to sleep. Cry out. Wake him up. This infuriated them. They took their lances and they cut themselves and the blood ran. They thought their God would see the blood gushing and, and surely give heed to their supplications and send down the fire. Well, they raved until the time of the evening offering. Old Elijah went over to the altar of God which had been thrown down and he took twelve stones and he rebuilt it. Each one of those stones represented one of the tribes of Israel. He cut up his wood and laid it in order, and then he cut up his sacrifice and put it on top of the wood. No fire underneath. And then he dug a trench around the altar. And he made an unusual request. He said, I want four barrels of water poured on that sacrifice. I used to read that and think, man, the prophet's parked his brains. Four barrels of water. It had rained three and a half years. We're going to get four barrels of water. Then later dawned on me that Mount Carmel juts out into the Mediterranean Sea. And so they just went down the hill, got salt water, poured on four barrels. He said, it's not enough. Need four more. So they went down and got four more and four. He said, still not enough. Need four more. So they went down and poured that. Got four more and then poured that on. Well, that sacrifice was drenched. The wood was soaking wet. The rocks glistening with water. While the dirt around the altar had been turned into mud, the trench was full of water. And then Elijah said, O oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, send the fire that they may know that you're God and I'm your prophet and I have done these things at your word. And scarcely had the words fallen from his lips until the fire fell from heaven, hit that sacrifice, consumed it, devoured the rocks, the wood, the fire of God ran along the ground, licked up the water before it, and when it had finished its work, it was as dry as tinder. And all the people who had been standing fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said, Seize him. He caught those 450 prophets. He took them right behind that hill to the brook Kishon and killed Every one of them. One day, the Lord Jesus walking down the road, two fellows standing there, one of them nudged the other and said, Hey, you see that fellow yonder? Yeah. That's Elijah. Tough, you bet. He is so tough, I believe he's motivated by a holy zeal that would lead him to kill in the name of God. They were wrong. But they saw something in his personality that led them to that conclusion. Now, when you look at John the Baptist, and when you look at Elijah, I mean you're going to see flint. You're going to see steel. Tough, tough, tough. But you know, you can bear down on that aspect of the Lord's nature to such an extent as to come up with a perverted view of Jesus. Jonathan Edwards is best known probably for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I think it's a bit extreme. And I wouldn't want anyone to get the idea that Jesus has the soul of man suspended on a string and he's just swinging it back and forth and back and forth over a boiling cauldron of hell, anxiously awaiting the time when he can snap the string and watch the man fall into the fire and then be tossed to and fro in the wild raging waves of a hellish sea forever. No, that'd be a perverted view. No, we need to see his toughness. We need to recognize how hard he is. But on the other hand, we need to see that gentle side to the personality and the nature of Jesus. Some of our religious friends, as you well know, pray to Mary. I'm not sure I know all the reasons for this, but I'd like to make a suggestion or so. 
These good people, and I do not intend to be needlessly offensive, look upon Jesus as a personality of wrath and justice. And they think that when they go to Him, about all they can expect is to be hurt. But they see Mary as being sweet, compassionate, tender, kind, and understanding. And so they call upon her and say, Holy Mother, please intercede with your Son. Take our supplications to Him and get this done for us. She hears the prayers and she goes to this stern, wrathful personality and says, Son, hear these intercessions. Have mercy upon these people. After all, I'm your mother. And his countenance relaxes and he smiles and he says, All right, Mother, I'll do it for you. And I am convinced if these good people understood that every trait they seek in Mary they can find in Jesus, they would never offer another prayer to Mary. Not another one. They pray to Him. You see, the Lord has the sweet side, too. Have you, uh, have you paid much attention to the pictures of Jesus? There was a woman in St. Louis who said that she'd seen the Lord. The lady to whom she was talking asked, well, how do you know it was the Lord? She said, well, it was just like all his pictures. I had to struggle with that one for a while. I haven't really seen a picture of Jesus, but I've seen some, some ideas. You have too. He uh, looks effeminate a lot of times. He's got the long hair hanging down around his shoulders and his skin is white, looks like all the skin, the, the blood's been drained from his body. If a hard wind blew against him, he'd hit the ground. So you think, well, he ought to have a little lace there for the sleeves. I look at that, I wonder how in the name of common sense could the personality projected by that picture cause Thomas to fall down and say, My Lord and my God! How could a personality projected in that picture win the admiration and the worship? of Peter and Paul and James and John. How in the world would demons flee from that kind of a being? Well, there's something that's not quite appropriate with a picture. But you know, on the other hand, there's something captured in those pictures that maybe we have overlooked. I had a girl to come to me one day after class, incidentally, she's now on the faculty at Harding. And she was very serious. She asked, how can I, as a female, identify with a male Savior? And I asked, well, how can I, as a Gentile, identify with a Jewish Savior? And how can a black identify with a white Savior? And I said, I think if you'll answer those two questions, you will have answered yours. And I pointed out to her that his being white, Jewish, and male were just incidental. That Jesus in reality was humanity. He was a representative of us all. Now, that means the great traits you look for in good men, such as boldness and aggressiveness and daring and, and bravery, you'll find in Jesus. But it also means the great traits you look for in good women, you will find in Jesus. He was sweet. He was compassionate. He was gentle. He was understanding. And that's why some said he was Jeremiah. Well, who was Jeremiah? He was a gentleman who lived in the 7th and the 6th centuries before Christ. He did his work in Judah. It was a time of digression and apostasy. He pleaded with the people not to trust in Egypt, but to trust the Lord. He pleaded with the people not to fight against the Babylonians, and because of that, he was considered as a traitor. He was placed in, uh, in the stocks. He was ridiculed and lampooned and made fun of by his own relatives and friends. Now, on one occasion, he was about to leave the community, and he was arrested. Well, you're going out to betray us to the Babylonians. He was pitched into a cistern. It didn't have any water in it, but it was muddy, and he mired up in the clay. Ebed Melech, a good man, sought permission from the king and rescued him. Jeremiah said, I preached to you 23 years, and you won't listen to me. Finally, 
what he had been predicting came to pass. In 588, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian legions came. They surrounded Jerusalem. And they hammered and hammered and hammered. And after 18 months, that community fell. I know this is pretty gruesome. But let me tell you about Babylonian soldiers. Some of them delighted in plunging a sword into the stomach of a pregnant woman and ripping her wide open so that both she and the baby would die. And some of them were experts at grabbing infant children by the heels and just swinging them head downward against the rocks and they'd literally batter their brains out. That was fun to them. Jeremiah saw that. He saw the blood run in Jerusalem streets like water. He saw the dead stack like cordwood. He saw the little children as they fainted because they were hungry. And he was inspired by God after Jerusalem failed to write the book of Lamentations. And as he walks through the cities of Jerusalem beholding the destruction and chaos, not one time does he ever reflect on the wisdom of God. The people have sinned. They're being punished justly. But how his heart went out to the people. Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And so we call him the weeping prophet. He had a heart as big as this house. He could be touched with the heartaches and the hardships of other people. I read a scholar many years ago who said to refer to Jeremiah as a weeping prophet is to suggest weakness. And I thought... Man, what in the world is your concept of strength? To weep is to be weak? Well, I suppose head bloodied but unbowed, no show of emotion, stiff upper lip, that's strength, huh? I'm not teaching school this semester, but I've been going to chapel this week. An old ugly Jerry Jones got up and made a talk this morning. And down near the end of that talk, Told about how we met when he was 15, and I taught him the gospel and baptized him. What do you think I did? Man, I sat there on the front row and cried. I cry rather easily. I, can you imagine anyone crying over Jerry Jones? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that may not be a good illustration, but <laughs> uh, I don't believe that's weakness. I happen to love the old boy, love him like a brother. About the nearest thing to a brother I have in the world, he and Lot Tucker. So, uh, think about it. But more importantly, think about Hebrews 5. The inspired writer in Hebrews 5 says that in order for one to be a high priest, he must be chosen from among men. And he sets about to prove that Jesus meets that qualification. In other words, he was chosen from among men. But what are the two traits he cites to prove it? First, that he cried. Hebrews 5 and 7, he refers back to Gethsemane. I cried. And second, he suffered. To prove he was a man, he told about his tears. So manly men weep and they cry. According to Luke 19, when Jesus was about to make the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, He came around the southeastern edge of the Mount of Olives. And the city of Jerusalem broke on His view. And He began to weep. Now, I just imagine the people who were present had no earthly idea as to why He was crying. Of course, you and I have the benefit of the revelation. We know why He's crying. When he saw that city, he knew in less than 40 years it would be leveled because the people were then in the process of rejecting him as the divine Son of God and he was weeping over the catastrophe they would experience. John chapter 11. He went to the grave of Lazarus. The man had been dead for four days. John 11.35 says Jesus wept. When our children were little... We would have devotionals, and sometimes we would ask them to quote Scripture. Okay, give me a verse. John 11.35, Jesus wept. Ha, I got it before you did. Hey, let's say it again. John 11.35, Daddy, shortest person in the Bible. Jesus wept. I, 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 wait, whoa, 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 whoa. you don't know it. Oh, yeah, I do. No, you don't. Yeah, I know it. Jesus wept. No, you don't either. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. 
view of the earth. What does this mean? I say, you, you don't really know it. You know these two words, but you don't know what that means. What does John 11.35 mean anyhow? The Lord was not weeping over that dead man. Now, I say that for two reasons. Number one, we must all die sometime. And number two, he was about to get him up anyway. He wasn't weeping over him. But what about those two broken-hearted sisters, Mary and Martha? John 11.35 means God Almighty in the flesh was so touched by human grief that hot tears coursed down His cheeks. Now, that's what it means. That's the tender, and that's the compassionate side of Jesus. I must be getting older, because as I look around, I see trouble, 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 grief, heartache, sorrow. And I spent time on the phone today talking to a dearly beloved Christian brother in South Arkansas. He's 67. He lost his 63-year-old wife. What do I tell Dawson Henry? He's one of the elders in the church there where I preached for four years. I let him know that we're concerned, that we're praying for him, that we appreciate him, that we love him. You see, I'm convinced that even though for Dawson this is one of the most traumatic experiences in his life, that Jesus the Christ is there and that he strengthens him that He comforts Him, that He helps Him, that He weeps with Him, as it were. When I was 11, I lost my mother. And if you will pardon the personal reference, she was all I had. I mean all. I didn't have a father. I didn't have any brothers and sisters. I had only my mother. And to show you how ignorant I was, I went to the church building, and I sat at the back. Now, this was for the funeral service. My aunts and uncles and their children were down at the front. Someone found me at the back, brought me up to the front. I cried and cried and cried until I just couldn't cry anymore. As I look back on that experience with a perspective of 38 years, I'm convinced the Son of the Living God was there to help that 11-year-old boy through the trial. When I was 24, I lost my second mother, my grandmother. And I believe he was there then. When I was 25, I lost my grandfather. And those were the three most precious people in the world to me. My mother, my grandmother, my grandfather. They're all gone. Jesus said that we're to weep with those that weep, and we're to rejoice with those who rejoice. And I believe what he taught through Paul, he practices. You're going to have trouble. There's no way to miss it. Well, there is one way. You can die young. If you die young, you won't have any trouble. If you live, you're going to have trouble. Now, when it comes, to whom will you turn for aid? The great military conqueror who's known just a succession of victories and no defeats? The outstanding athlete hit 350 homers? You're going to turn to the entertainer who has uh, 20 million records out? You may turn to that military figure. You may seek the aid of the athlete. You may seek the assistance of the entertainer. But you won't turn to the military man because of his military exploits, and you won't turn to the athlete because of what he's done as a baseball player, and you won't turn to the entertainer because of what he or she has done as a singer. You'll turn to the individual because that person has the capacity to identify with your grief. A man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief, that's the kind you want when you're in trouble. And that's the language Isaiah used to describe Jesus. A man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief. In Romans eleven twenty two, you have a beautiful summation of what I've tried to say. Paul said, Behold the goodness and the severity of the Lord. Tough? You bet. I believe Jesus will take your head off. If you live and die in rebellion to His will. I believe you'd damn a rebel without blinking an eye. But I believe if one surrenders, strives to do right, although he'll make many mistakes, Jesus will be tender and compassionate and sympathetic and understanding and full of grace and save that one. You look at His life. 
you see with whom he expressed that toughness and with whom he expressed that tenderness and that will give you the insight as to what's going to happen in the day of judgment. Now we're going to all meet the Lord one of these days. We're going to give an account. I don't want to meet the tough side. I want to meet the tender side. He said in Matthew 23, and after he had spoken so harshly and so severely, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them that are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thee unto myself as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? And you would not. I grew up in the country. We always had some hens around the place. Storm cloud blew up, began to thunder. The hen would cluck. She'd hover. Those little biddies would run under Jesus said to the people, I want to do for you what a hen does for her chickens. I want to be tender and compassionate and understanding. If anyone in this audience loses his soul, that one will be responsible. Christ is not anxious to condemn. He didn't come into the world to condemn. He came to save it. But if we know of Jesus crucified and risen, if we know He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, if we know that He has commanded us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, and we reject Him and we reject His teaching, we'll be lost. And we'll be lost eternally. But if we yield our wills to His will and we struggle and strive, He'll be tender with us and we'll be saved. What do you want to meet in judgment? I know what you want to meet. The same one I want to meet. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he will say to us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. In spite of our sins, in spite of our mistakes, you'll be tender with us. But if you have continually, deliberately, willfully, and habitually lived in rebellion to his will, you have no hope of going to heaven. And I urge you tonight, if you're lost and know it, if you're lost as an erring brother or sister, if you're lost as one who has never initially repented and been baptized into Christ, come this evening and do His will. We're going to sing 131. We all know it. And while we sing, we ask you to come right now. Won't you please come right now as we stand together?